said, how do you, how do you live with yourself not really knowing, you know, all about your father, about at, at that time they were putting together the Louis Armstrong house, t- turning it into a museum. And these were things that I didn't know. And how, you know, why you're not a part of his public life. Like when I read the will and saw the affidavit where I was systematically erased uh, saying that he had no children. I knew in that moment it was time for me to find a way to tell my story. Like I, I, I didn't know how, I didn't know what I was gonna do, but I knew that I had to find a way and that started the process. Because mom so and her husband, say. Slim, they were dancers in black vaudeville. My father was already famous, he was a headliner. And then they would put together shows in those days you know, like the Motown Review was still doing that. But in the 40s, headliners and then the second acts, you know, the dancers, they would always be a comedian, uh, maybe uh, a vocalist. And then the headliner would be my father or Billy or Count or, you know, one of the bigger acts. Slim and Sweets would be part of those shows. This time we'll and... do it with mirrors and feature the clever team of Slim and Sweets in Tap Happy. <laughs> I have a picture of uh, Mom and Slim. They were having a party at their house, and my father and his wife uh, were sitting on the couch. My mother was on that end. Slim was on the other end. They're all, you know, just having fun. And uh, the letters that I have, Slim, uh, my father wrote to Slim, talking about Slim and Sweets. He wrote to both of them. And then, you know, Slim passed, unfortunately in 1950 and that's when the friendship between my mother and my father became more of a relationship after that. Go to shows, did so. you see him play very much? Oh yeah, I saw him play a, a lot. Uh, okay. Very fortunate as, you know, from the time I was three, mom and I went on the road with him and I would say from three to seven or eight years old, we traveled with him in the summers. And we'd spend the summers in various towns on going, traveling uh, on the bus. And wherever he was playing, if it was a nightclub, I couldn't be in front. Sometimes I'd be in the dressing room or I'd be on the stage. And he came to the Jones Beach Theater and he did a show with Guy Lombardo. And uh, so the main part of the show, you know, you sit in stands and see the show. And then there was an after show. Uh, at Jones Beach Theater, and it was—it seemed like it was in an outdoor tent. Hello Dolly was popular, and he played Hello Dolly, and they kept asking for an encore, and I think he did an, about seven encores. And what I enjoyed about it, every time he started it up, he had a different take, and you know he improvised. I was ten, and I—I I, well, I've been listening to his music and Ella. You know, Jimmy Smith, that, that was the foundation in my home all the time. So I had a good sense of music and then hearing him, you know, to this day, that's how I judge all, all musicians. But I really noticed how he, you know, really had the audience, you know, um, involved. Like he and they, 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 they were just having fun together. And they were hollering more. And you know, a lot of performers, they don't like to, you know, overplay their hits. Some don't even want to play their hits at a concert. They want to stretch out, even though people are going there to hear them play their hits. But, but he, he wasn't that way. He wanted to entertain the audience and give them what they wanted. And they kept calling for Hello, Dolly. And he would start it up and do a portion of it. So many different ways. I don't know if anybody... Were his lips deformed from playing so much? Yeah, he, he, yeah they were. Um, and he, um, f- he had uh, like his, his upper lip. Callous? Cal- it was callous, but it wasn't hard callous. But it was callous and it was uh, misshaped. And in order to keep it functional, he had a certain salve that he would use, and uh, I think it was a European company that made this salve. 
and he would travel with you know um you know many many uh containers of it and i you also know, remember cool. he got to see the play funny girl when it was originally on broadway and he saw it with barbara streisand of course she was the only one in it and he just raved about it it was the best thing he'd ever seen raved about her and of course a few years later he got to do that cameo in the film version of hello dolly with her but now ladies and gentlemen here's one you all can sing with us when the saints go marching in <laughs> somebody during the period of time where you that was particularly nice to you that you remember a musician was there somebody along there that you had this special connection with I, I think the person that was nicest to me for whatever reason uh, was his drummer uh, Danny Barcelona and I think he was the last drummer my father had with the all-stars and he was just always very polite, always spoke to mom and I, always had a smile. But I remember Danny fondly and also my father's valet, Doc Pugh, you know, on, at the times that we would travel, you know, just making sure that we were well taken care of. Oh, I was Beatles. Yeah. And, and it was also, um, at one point, it was Beatles Dave Clark Five. Uh, so, the Beatles and Stones, definitely a little bit of a conflict. But when it was Beatles, Dave Clark Five, Beatles all the way. But truly, uh, growing up with the Beatles and going through from I, Ed Sullivan, I want to hold your hand all the way through um, uh, Yellow Submarine and, and um, the, is it the magic, Magical? Oh, Abbey Road. I think was the last one, but the White Album, I think I was maybe 10, 11, and boy, what an impression that made on me. I think that that was one of the greatest albums. I love their early stuff, but that was the album that really, you know, stuck with me, and that was the album that we were of age where my friends and I would just go to somebody's house, and we had the little portable record player, and, um, just play it over and over and we just thought we were so cool because we had the White Album and we were playing it. In fact, it. Um, my good friend Jody and I, uh, in my teen years, we went to some great, great shows and we saw Al Jarreau. Uh, we would see him on many occasions through the years. But uh, I think it was, it, I don't think it exists anymore. It was called the Savoy. And it was a medium sized venue. And wow, what, what a show. We were just talking about this the other day. We saw Boss Gags when he first came out with Silk Degrees. And what, that was one of the best concerts, just the way it was set up. Uh, he did, I remember, three encores. And we happened to see him the night before the blackout. So we saw him and um, just was completely blown away. You know, when they say the soundtrack of your life? So for music, it just seemed that for everything I did, no matter what it was, there is a sound or a song that I can associate with it. It's from being a young child in our apartment in Harlem, my mother and I, I can associate uh, artists, not only my father and Ella, but I can associate artists like Jonah Jones and hearing that sound and, you know, mom dancing to that. Or when I was in St. Mark's School, the show my mother would put on variety shows and Lloyd Price was uh, popular with personality and I performed with that. So if I, you know, when I think of Lloyd Price and Fats Domino uh, around that time, my, my 
my first grammar school comes comes into play and I can go back to a time in high school when we were talking about, you know, Marvin Gaye and what his uh, opera, uh, operatic soundtrack of to what's going on, that whole piece and then war came out. And I was graduating from high school when war came out with the world is a ghetto and how I was really going out of childhood into adulthood, leaving the comfort of high school into a world of just a whole bunch of people, unrelated, no relationships, and, and seeing the world, you know, through more political eyes. And you know, so that sound colored my um, college years and my, my thoughts. So for music to me, you know, it, it really is a soundtrack of different things that I do. There's always a song that, or a, a, a period of music that I can associate with it and it just brings the whole period into view. Right. Uh, and... In school, when I was in second grade, I started lessons. So from second grade to uh, junior in high school, a long time. Yeah, 10 years that I played with the, played the accordion and uh, it was the Carota brothers. They came to the demonstration. I said to my mother, I want to play. And of course I was the only black kid, not only playing the accordion in their studio, but when we traveled on the road for accordion competitions and uh, once a year, they were throughout the country, Detroit, New York, uh, we went to Washington, D.C. You were a you didn't even know it. <laughs> exactly, I, I was the representative. But I enjoyed it because I enjoyed being with the group and we had fun playing together. We'd always play uh, like the fourth movement of a symphony as we competed and the accordion orchestra was set up where, just like a regular orchestra. So the accordion, we only use mainly the right side, the keys, like the piano keys. And there'd be the strings, there'd be the woodwinds, uh, the, the brass section. And we would play their parts on the right side. Very rarely were the chords on the left side used. And, um, we, we'd really recreate these pieces. The sound was fan fabulous. The group that I was with was top notch and, and many times we would win in these competitions. And we would travel together on the bus and I didn't even realize how much of a connection it was from when I was a child, being on the bus with my father, going to play, being, you know, the camaraderie, camaraderie with the people and then winning and then coming back home. We, we take a, a week and be on the road together. So I played the accordion. I also was fortunate enough when I lived in Mount Vernon, in the summertime, all of the music departments came together and uh, they set up what they called uh, summer, uh, summer uh, well, we called it summer band school, but it was like the music recreation program. And you could sign up to learn how to play uh, different instruments, play in ensembles, groups, and I just signed up to play uh, and learn the clarinet, the French horn, uh, percussion, piano, and guitar. So I, I know how to play all of these instruments. I was never great at practicing, but I could, uh, you know, very, very good at reading music. So I, you know, I, I did learn, as I said, you know, without having that discipline of practicing, I never took it to the next level to be a professional. And I don't think I ever really wanted to be a, a professional musician. I just always wanted to enjoy it and I thought I would go into teaching. But, um, you know, I became a young mother in, in high school, fortunate enough to go to college and I discovered marketing. Okay. And music. that's the and path, that's the career the one path who was I, more I took. Influential than Marvin. I love them all. Marvin, the Temps, the Four Tops, but Smokey Robinson, 
oh my goodness, and the miracles, they were the ones that I felt were the tops of the world. And, and Stevie Wonder, I enjoyed, but I enjoyed Stevie more as an adult than, as, uh, than young Stevie. But Marvin Gaye, it was, he was just um, handsome. He just had a, a way about him. And I enjoyed his music as a young teen. You know, he was, he was a teen idol. More, you know, then, Jermaine, then the Jacksons came and, and Michael and Jermaine were teen idols. But Smokey was just the pinnacle of music. But Marvin was, uh, to me, like, uh, you know, the teen idols that you pull out their pictures in the teen magazines. He, he was that type. Was this the mid-60s? This was the late 60s. Late 60s. Yeah. And See, the early 60s, Marvin, you know, I, I, I was more, more smoky, the Supremes, the Temptations. And as I, you know, um, got older, I was junior high school, then, then Marvin's music just... Just before he actually put out the album that uh, I feel transformed all of music and took it in another direction, what's going on that year, you know, Marvin's Marvin Gaye's his his suite is like an operatic suite that uh, many many groups started emulating after Marvin did that. Music took a turn, and soul music took a turn because. It was soul music, um, Motown, all of it, more happy, not so much intro, intro, introspective, not really talking about and calling out the political nature and uh, things that were wrong or uh, the plight of, of African Americans and, and or poor people. Music wasn't doing that. It was singing and dancing, it was uppy, or was uh, talking about love and broken hearts, but not about the state of the world. And Marvin and, you know, and Gil Scott Heron came in at that time, the, tempt the impressions, you know, um, I, I think right before Marvin put out that album, the impressions, because they were involved with uh, Martin Luther King and, and his movement. So, and King was killed in 68, uh, and people get ready, the impressions, you know, and, and though, that's when music started really focusing on our, the, the state of where we were as, as black Americans, so. And did you see at that point, you were old enough to be aware of the music, did you see a, a, an immediate change in the tenor of the songs that were coming out? Was I, it, I did. It did, yeah. Yeah. And I, is there a song or is there, a band or th that that strikes a chord with you of of being like that turning point. Well, you know, once Marvin did that, I would say I started not only listening to R and B, but I was drawn to I would say kind of folk and and then jazz and um, not so much spoken word, but I the, the essence of what spoken word is. You know, really talking about who we are as people and, and, and the, talking about the political nature of things. And then I started listening to artists like Gil Scott Heron, who, you know, I don't know. Gil Scott Heron. Oh my God. Um, so I just learned something new. That's awesome. What, 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 a what a poet. Okay. Um, he did songs like Johannesburg. He called out, uh, apartheid. He did, um, his popular song, one of them, was uh, the bottle talking about you know how someone turns to alcoholism and the but the lyrics were such that you it was uh, you identified with a person and winter in America groups like war came out and uh, they were talking to the world as a ghetto you know th this is you know all of these songs were were starting to come out and and just really. Uh, speaking about it's still in high you know, school Black when uh, this started uh, coming out, yeah. and but it's, when I went to college, I was also a young single mother, so I wasn't really uh, an activist in the sense of, 
you know, going to rallies. You were busy. Or, uh, I was busy. School and a kid, yeah. Is that, but I was very aware of uh, what was going on. And I, you know, started listening and learning more about politics and, and made sure that when I turned 18 that I could vote. So that was very important to me that um, really from the time I was 18, I, you know, voting and who I was going to vote for. And I, I, and then I started watching some political shows on television, you know, the few that were there, like Meet the Press. Um, and, but, you know, in those days it was the, the three newscasts and you would hear, you know, news from them and then you'd see clips on TV. Later years, I, in my 40s, was when I started getting more politically active or more issues oriented and started volunteering to help oh. register people to vote. <laughs> well, That's when I moved to Florida. Were yeah. you a dancer when you were young? Did you like to dance? I liked to dance, but I wasn't a dancer. My mother was the dancer in the family, and I could never hold a candle to her. You know, I came out as, you know, I looked at my mother who was a world-class dancer. You'd I'd see videos, of the, you know, the, the video of her and, and just see her. She would just perform at my school when we would do uh, programs to raise money, put on variety. She put on variety shows uh, when I was at St. Mark's, when I was at Sacred Heart. And, um, you know, I got to see her dance, I guess all the way up into her late 50s. And she, she was just fantastic. And then on the other side, my father, one of the greatest instrumentalists in the world and, and, and creating modern jazz. And I, in the middle, I was so-so at playing music and I could hold my own on the dance floor. And I'm like, I, I, I missed. I didn't, I didn't get, you know, the, the greatness of both. But I, I, you know what I did from, from both of them um, more my father was the business side and my passion is one of them is being on the radio in Sarasota or in college being on the radio club because my father would send audio messages and he would curate them with some music and then he'd talk and he'd put some music on it and that was just ingrained in me and, and you know without realizing it when I got to Westchester Community College, I joined the radio club. When I went to Iono College, I joined the radio club and was just drawn to, you know, music, talking, and just instinctively knew how to put it together. So that's where you, you have a beautiful voice for you.